Hello everybody, welcome to the end of the first week and the fifth lesson here as part of the context for the study of the English Romantics 1798 to 1832. Today we will be looking at the context of science. Some of you will possibly react and say it's odd to contextualize uh, English Romantic writers with their emphasis on nature, imagination and children within the science of the age. However, much contemporary work has shown that many of these writers were keen observers of contemporary scientific developments. They had an acute and active interest in the science of the period. Various kinds of science and scientific interests mark the English Romantic writers. Uh, let's take as our opening move uh, Mary Shelley's classic horror tale Frankenstein. It's appropriate we begin with this because it's the 200th anniversary of this particular novel. Frankenstein first appeared in 1818. Mary Shelley's classic horror tale incorporates the science of galvanism and several theories of life from that period. Um, Victor Frankenstein, that's the scientist, let's not make a mistake. Frankenstein is the name of the scientist, not the monster. The monster in the text is unnamed. But for some reason, we have historically always associated Frankenstein with the monster, not the uh, scientist himself. Here is Victor speaking about his training in the sciences. That's up there as your first slide. Monsieur Waldman says Victor Frankenstein, he's documenting it, concluded and uh, this is his encounter with various scientists and tutors in various universities across Europe. Uh, Frankenstein is trying to find the secret of life and this is what Waldman says. The ancient teachers of the science, said he, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers seem only to only made to dabble in dirt, and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake and even mock the invisible world within its own shadows. That is Wallman. Now, if you read the novel, you'll discover that Victor Frankenstein, explores chemistry, biology and various sciences of its time, travels across Europe trying to find the secret of life, trying to find a scientific theory which would help him create, generate life in the laboratory. As you know, he does discover the secret of life and he creates a creature whom he does not then like and does not wish to take responsibility for. But that's one. So Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, often regarded as the first science fiction novel, is at the center of the romantic period as well. But we will move on to other sciences, specifically uh, as our next case, astronomy and space sciences. Mary Shelley's husband, the poet Percy Shelley, had a long lasting influence in astronomy and other sciences. And it has now come in for sustained attention. In Prometheus Unbound and Epipsychidian, Shelley would say uh, several things which draw directly upon um, scientific theories. That's up there on slide two. I see a mighty darkness filling the seat of power and rays of gloom dart round as light from the meridian sun. In Epipsychidian, Percy Shelley would write, but she whom prayers or tears then could not tame, passed like a god throned on a winged planet, whose burning plumes to tenfold swiftness fan it into the dreary cone of our lives shade. One stood on my path, who seemed as like the glorious shape which I had dreamed, as is the moon whose changes ever run into themselves to the eternal sun. Shelley's interest in astronomy, studied extensively by many people, uh, the Wordsworth era's interest in disease, um, transmission of diseases, uh, preliminary theories of disease as to how disease spread, uh, etiologies and transmission and prophylactic measures geology are some of the sciences that figure in it. What we have looked at in the case of Epipsychidian is an interest in astronomy and the space sciences. John Keats is on first looking into Chapman's Homer and George Gordon, Lord Byron's Cain also adopted and adapted astronomical images of planets, exploratory and contemporary instrumentation. Here is your next slide. This is John Keats on first looking into Chapman's Homer, says Keats. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken. Keats is directly referencing the use of telescopes and the discovery of distant planets. Now note what's happening here and I would urge you to draw a parallel with what we have already said. Please remember the last le two lessons on empire. 
England was engaging with distant parts of the world, Asia, China, the South America, Africa and other places. So England was having its hands full of material, ideas of racial and cultural difference coming in from the different parts of the globe. Parallel to that is its engagement with the solar system and the world outside Earth itself. So you need to think of this tiny island, poets and writers in this tiny island, looking outward, not just at themselves. They looked outward at Asia, they looked outward at Africa, but they also looked outward. As Keith says here, I felt, he says, like some watcher of the skies, he's referring to an astronomer, of course, when a new planet swims into his skin. A new planet swimming into his skin is a direct reference to something coming into your range of vision via a telescope. Now, surely this is something to be considered that the English Romantic authors were clearly tracking developments in the sciences, especially astronomy. Take a look now at another sciences, another set of sciences that play an important role in the Romantic imagination, geology and the earth sciences. There was a considerable amount of interest in geology. Noah Herringman's book is called uh, Romanticism and Rocks, the interest in geology. It was just as a science, geology was just coming into its own. But Wordsworth's resolution and independence, for example, developed the image of the huge stone. I quote, as a huge stone is sometimes seen to lie, couched on the bald top of an eminence. The tired body of the leech gatherer in Wordsworth's famous poem aligns with various objects such as clouds and wood in the course of the poem and is eventually described, I quote, soon with this, he other matter blended. That sounds like scientific experimentation. As Noah Herringman argues, Wordsworth shows the old man as incorporated with the forms of nature, mergers, assimilation, hybridization. We are looking at different chemistries, different biologies, and how they could perhaps come together. In Coleridge's Kubla Khan, the imagery of caverns and underground spaces proceed, uh, as critics like Frederick Berwick have argued, from an interest in the geological sciences of the period, and constitute aesthetically what Berwick calls a subterranean sublime. And I quote here for you um, a passage from arguably Coleridge's most famous poem, Kubla Khan. Here it is, up there as your next slide. Where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man. Note what Coleridge is doing here. The sacred river, sacred being the realm of the religious and the theological, moves through caverns measureless to man. Caverns measureless to man is a clear a reference to geological studies of rocks and rock formations. Moving on, botany and theories of life influenced poems like Shelley's The Sensitive Plant and supported the Wordsworthian argument about the spirit of all material objects. When there are discussions of life, naturally medical science can't be far behind and the English Romantics were equally interested in uh, medical science as well. In medicine, Edward Jenner, uh, the famous uh, immunologist, was experimenting with vaccination and his period overlaps with that of the Romantics. Edward Jenner is 1749 to 1823. He was experimenting with vaccination and Coleridge and Sadi proved Jenner's most ardent campaigners in the periodical press. And numerous uh, works in the recent past, Tim Fulford, Debbie Lee and others have written on the interest in yellow fever, vaccination and others. But medical science was also dealing with tropical diseases, mainly cholera and malaria. Um, why cholera and malaria? Note, malaria and cholera were tropical diseases. And please recall what we have said in the earlier lessons. Englishmen going out to the colonies were coming back, but many times they came back having suffered from or were carriers of cholera and malaria. Please understand what this means. The Englishman who goes out to the colonies into the distant parts of the world often came back carrying pathogens. Please recall what I have said. China, pottery, tea, tobacco, all of which manufactured in other parts of the world were entering England, so was disease. In other words, the English romantics were also concerned about the fact that the distant parts of the world were impinging upon the English immune system. It was not just the influence of the East and the tropics on their national economy. It was also to be worrisome for them that 
the pathogens from distant parts of the world were also affecting the national immune system. Alan Buell's path breaking work Romanticism and Colonial Disease 1999 demonstrates in his fascinating study how Keats, Coleridge and Mary Shelley were all directly or indirectly negotiating with theories of disease that often left villages in uh, England devoid of healthy young men. John Bu Alan Buell refers to the depopulation narratives in these texts such as Wordsworth's The Brothers uh, where entire villages had no young people left. At this point I would like to mention the fact that the first novel about a pandemic was also written by Mary Shelley during this time. Mary Shelley wrote the novel The Last Man which is about a pandemic that wipes out practically all mankind and it is literally the last man surviving. Now what have we got here then? In terms of science the English Romantics had an interest in astronomy, botany, life as in medical, medical sciences and life, geology and practically any scientific development of the time. But as I just concluded the important thing to realize is that the English were interested in not only the English countryside but the distant world but also the distant world beyond the earth. But this distant world was also coming into England. So English poets and authors had to engage with people who came back carrying diseases like malaria and cholera. It was at the same time that people like Edward Jenner were experimenting with vaccination. So in addition to imagining a country, imagining a nation, they were also worried about what Priscilla Wall in a study of uh, invasion narratives in popular culture in the 20th century called imagined immunities. That is, it was not just the imagined community of England but the imagined immunity of English corporeal immunity and immunological borders that influenced and informed English writings of this particular period. Now like I said it might seem very odd and awkward to think of the English romantics whom we have traditionally seen as interested in beauty and nature being interested in disease. But people have noted that central figures of the English um, romantic pantheon such as the ancient mariner have come back looking long lank and brown I quote from the poem which suggests some kind of skin ailment which he has inherited from his tropical voyages. Clearly the sciences had a huge impact on the English romantics. This is something you also need to keep in mind when you next look at a text like Kubla Khan with the reference to rocks. When you look at uh, Shelley's Mont Blanc which is about mountains. Several aesthetic theories and imaginative discourses were centered around science. Thank you.